Hello everyone and welcome to The Wild Side. This is your host Caitlin Kite and that was Cindy Lauper with True Colors. Now on today's show I'm going to delve again into the world of theoretical uh, mathematics and thinking about using math and computer models to think about animal behavior and, and evolution. And I know that this is something that I've been doing quite a lot of recently and I kind of promised myself after last week's show that I wasn't going to do it again, at least for a while. But then I came across a paper. Actually, this paper was sent to, be, sent to me by my husband, who is also a scientist, and he thought I really should think about putting it on the show. And at the time, I thought, well, you know, we've already done a lot of these mathematical, statistical, heavy type things, and I don't know if people want to hear that again. But then I read the paper, and it turns out that it involves a couple of topics that I've had in the last two shows, and so it seemed a really perfect way to kind of tie all those things in together and think about how, how all of this stuff relates and why this is kind of an interesting and useful sort of thing to be doing in science. So I hope you'll bear with me one more time to think about uh, some theoretical work and how this can be married in with field work to look at real world situations, real world animals and real world habitats and actually have kind of useful implications both for theoretical work but also for management and, and conservation and kind of applied work as well. Now the topic in particular that I want to address today is something uh, that revolves around the hawk-dove game which is a topic that I have brought up kind of briefly on the show in the past and I think I've kind of mentioned this as a theoretical model that has been useful, but then not really gone into much detail about it. And this basically is a device that allows researchers to think about how different strategies, different behavioral strategies, in this case being aggressive or being like the hawk and being peaceful or being like the dove, how these things can coexist in a population. And the idea behind this scenario is that strategies are inherited in a discrete manner. So you're either a hawk or you're a dove, and then uh, you behave in that way and this impacts then what happens in the habitat, it impacts your survival, it impacts your success, it impacts what happens in the next generation and then uh, you'll either see the persistence of these two different types of uh, kind of pathways in life or you'll see one kind of triumphing over another or maybe you'll just see the complete disappearance of all the animals altogether. It really depends on the scenario and the different parameters that you have in the model and the different sorts of things that are actually being looked at. Now this is a really useful thing for understanding um, certain aspects of wild systems, but the thing is it's never actually really been seen in a wild animal population. So it's really nice for theoretical work and thinking about generalities. How might this have happened? How might these things coexist? How might they interact with each other? But they're not actually testing that in a real world way. And so this has led some people to say that maybe these sort of game theoretic arguments are not actually relevant for real populations. It's really just kind of something you can sit around pondering, but then not actually apply in any real way. However, the authors of the current paper that I want to talk about today, they have found a group of birds, uh, these are Gouldian finches, that do seem to conform to this dynamic. And in Gouldian finches there are three different morphs. They've got a, a yellow head, a red head, or a black head. And the, uh, the one with the red head is a bit more aggressive and it's behaviorally dominant. And then there's the more peaceful black morph. And populations of this can really easily be invaded by the reds because the reds are so much more aggressive. So here you've got your hawks and your doves. And it turns out that the hawks are worse parents. So if there are too many of the red-headed birds, the fitness decreases because these guys are they're quite good at being aggressive but not so good at being parental. And this provides an evolutionary situation where uh, you would expect at least some of the black dove morph to be maintained because these guys are better parents and then should produce more or better or better surviving offspring. So this is kind of the perfect scenario to potentially see whether these hawk dove dynamics actually can be found in the real world and if they can, uh, what do kind of the modeled simulations look like relative to what we see out in the wild and how could these things inform each other. So in the current study, the authors are describing and investigating these dynamics, and they're also looking at the effects of real-life deviations from the simple original game. And a lot of these mathematical models, these theoretical uh, games or scenarios that are developed, they do have to be kind of simple because, you know, the real world has lots and lots of variables in it, and it's quite hard to predict. And so you kind of strip down to the most essential things and then use those to inform uh, the models that you're going to create. It's really difficult to have 
hundreds and thousands and millions of parameters like we actually do out in the wild. However, you know, the thing is that sometimes if, if you get one of those wrong, it can really throw everything off. Usually there are kind of a handful of really important things where uh, if you do adjust the other parameters, it actually won't make a huge difference. But if you adjust those core things, it will make a big difference. And these are the things that I was kind of referring to in the last couple of shows when I talked about whether something is robust or not as a model. So these things that incorporate all the really important core values and do it in the right way, those are going to be the most robust models. But in this case, the, the original kind of hawk dove model thinks about uh, asexual reproduction, so not sexual reproduction, which of course you would find in birds. And that means that basically you're thinking about a completely different way of inheriting the characteristic. And in particular, you're thinking there's not going to be any admixture of characteristics, because if you are um, reproducing sexually, then you're probably going to be uh, just reproducing a clone of yourself rather than mixing your genes with someone else's genes and, and potentially then coming up with a brand new phenotype. So we know, for example, that you can have dominant traits and recessive traits and that if you do have two parents that are recessive, uh, that, that carry the recessive gene even if they aren't showing that trait, then they can create an offspring that suddenly has that trait that neither one of them is showing. And so those are the sorts of dynamics that could really have a big impact if you're thinking about these sorts of things in the wild. And so that's what they want to do here and consider the maintenance or lack of maintenance of both the red or hawk uh, characteristic and the black or dove characteristic in populations. And then think about the effects that this has on overall population size and health of this particular group of birds. And so the result is the study that not only investigates the interesting dynamics within a particular species, but also has kind of far-reaching ramifications for studies that examine the maintenance of variability in general, whether you're talking about redheads, blackheads, hawk, dove, whatever the characteristics are, just variability in a particular trait within a population. And also it thinks about what is the function of theoretical models in research, and can this one be applied more broadly, or can any of them be applied broadly, and what is their value? So. That is kind of a, a summary of everything that's together in this manuscript. Now I want to actually walk you through each of the major sections as per usual. So I'll start with the introduction in which the authors give some background on the hawk dove model and also on the Gouldian finch that was studied here. So our understanding of uh, the frequency dependent nature of some animal behavior has been facilitated by using this hawk dove game. Now frequency dependent behavior means that basically you uh, choose to do something depending on how common or how not common something is. And the, the example that has always been, uh, has always stuck with me most is something that I heard as an undergrad where I had an, uh, a lecturer who said, you know, think about being at the airport and you're standing around the carousel waiting to get your luggage back. Now, if everyone has black suitcases, then it's really hard to figure out which suitcase is yours, spot it from a distance and grab it. So maybe you experience that once, you then go pick a yellow suitcase and take that on your trip, and your yellow suitcase stands out. But then lots of other people see that and say, hey, that's actually a really good idea, I'm going to do that too. So suddenly everyone has yellow suitcases, and you're back to where you were when everyone had black suitcases. So it's this kind of uh, idea that you're going to do something based on how much someone else is doing it in the population, and, and that the extent to which others are doing it is actually what makes it a useful thing or not. Now sometimes this might be something that you are actively choosing to do, so in the case of the suitcases, or it might be something that just kind of happens uh, because there is maybe a nature or, or nurture kind of thing going on. So that it might be a genetic thing, it might be environmentally controlled, you know, it might just happen on its own without your kind of actively regulating it. But whatever the case might be, you can have this um, variation in how much something happens relative to how much you are seeing it elsewhere in the population. When we introduced this into evolutionary thinking, it allowed us to ponder how it is that certain negative traits, like aggression, could be maintained at small numbers within populations. And it also provided information on how and why certain behavioral polymorphisms exist, so the existence of multiple ways to express a certain trait. And there are two defining features of the hawk dove game. The first is that when hawks are rare, they gain accesses to resource, uh, 
sorry, they gain access to resources easily, and that's because they're able to overwhelm doves. And the other is that hawks suffer negative fitness consequences when they're interacting with each other in populations where they've become too common. So basically, in the first scenario, you've got the hawks overpowering the more weak doves, and then in the second scenario, you've got multiple hawks all kind of spending all of their time fighting each other, and so that ends up actually being uh, not so great for their health overall and their fitness. Now to date, as I said earlier, there's been almost no empirical evidence of this in the wild in terms of finding you know, actual discrete morphs where you've got either a hawk or a dove, um, finding genetic inheritance of relevant strategies, and kind of finding a system where all of the above exist at once. But, as I suggested, the Gouldian finch seems to be a really good potential species in which this is found. So the current work focused on the Gouldian finch which is an endangered and declining bird species from northern Australia, and there are only about 2,500 individuals left in the wild. Now, as I said earlier, these guys have three different color morphs. You've got yellow, red, and black. And the yellow one is really infrequent, so it's about one in 2,000 birds. So the ones that are really important in terms of thinking about population dynamics and the link between the color, the behavior, and then the overall kind of changes to the population numbers and health, those are the black and the red ones. Now, birds with different colors also have different genes, and they express these different behaviors. So they really are very fundamentally different birds. The head color allele is found on the Z chromosome. And I should kind of take a pause to mention that birds are ZW, whereas we are XY. So the Z is the one that's larger and with more genes in kind of the same way that the X chromosome functions in humans. But in this case, uh, the ZZ is not a female, it's actually a male, and the females are ZW. So they have kind of a similar system to ours, except that whether you are a female or a male corresponds not only to different letters, but whether you have the same of those chromosomes, or one, um, one of each different chromosome. And I should probably also mention, just as a reminder, in case you don't think about genetics every day, uh, that alleles are different versions of a gene, so this is thinking about whether you have the dominant one or the recessive one, or those kind of variations. So the red individuals in this case, as I mentioned earlier, are the dominant ones, and they also have higher levels of testosterone and corticosterone in response to socially competitive environments. So these are the hawks, which can gain easy access to critical resources. Now this is important to think about in the context of the overall kind of finch lifestyle, because these guys are obligate cavity nesters, and that means that they have to nest within cavities because they need protection from predators. And the availability and quality of nest cavities can constrain their reproduction. So greater access to these resources, which is what's going to be available to the more aggressive red-headed individuals, this uh, could potentially allow them to be more reproductively successful. Potentially. So I'll get back to that in a second. Now, I want to talk about the genes for a moment as well. So we can think about redness as a dominant trait, uh, capital R. You kind of remember if you've, if you've had genetics in the past, you maybe made those little four-square diagrams where you think about the fact that we get an allele from each parent, and then you think about uh, what happens when you cross these things, and so whether you've got the, the dominant taking over, if you've got two of the recessives taking over, and think about the different combinations that you get depending on what genes you get from your parents. Well, that's kind of what I'm thinking about here. So individuals are either going to be double capital R or big R, little r, so that's the two male variations, if you're going to be uh, redness, have, a, have redness, or you're going to have females that are capital R because they have only got one of those chromosomes. So uh, whichever one they have, that's, that's what they express. And then the black individuals are going to be double little r if you're male or little r if you are female. And of course, you don't have to stock this away in your head. It's just these are the sorts of things that are going to be entered into the model so that they can think about what happens when these birds breed with each other, what young are they going to to uh, produce, and then how are those individuals going to go on and behave depending on what genes they have inherited and what trait they then express. Now we know that a number of reproductive traits vary depending on whether birds mate with their own color type or birds of another color. So just to go back to that gene thing for a second, if you have a male that is big R, big R, and he mates with a female who has little r, then the young males that they produce are going to have a big R and a little r, and they're going to be uh, just as dominant, they're going to be just as aggressive because they've gotten that from their father.
if you've got uh, same thing actually if you've got males that have the two little R's and a female that has a big R again you're still going to get that aggressive dominant trait but then if you've got uh, the home heterozygous sorry I can't talk again heterozygous males the big R little R and you've got uh, a little R female then suddenly they could be producing uh, two little R males and those guys would be quite different. So depending on which individuals are mating with which, you can have parents producing offspring that have their own trait or you'd be having parents that produce offspring with another trait depending on what their partner has and whether they've got a dominant or a recessive as the second chromosome or in the case of females they don't have that second chromosome at all. So suddenly it becomes very complicated and that's what's quite interesting in these Gouldian finches because actually we know that they do mate in a very selective way and that's related to the color variation. So we know that uh, when birds uh, are choosing their mates that this can impact the size of the clutch, the survival of the offspring and generally then the fitness of the adults. And this uh, basically, if you harvest all these data in the wild and look at what type of uh, male is mating with what type of female and vice versa, then what they find is that actually there seem to be signs of genetic incompatibilities when the parents are a mixed pair. So if you've got a red female with a black male or a red male with a black female. And what this means is that uh, this is just not working out for whatever reason. Those genes don't work very well together, and so this is selecting against that kind of mating choice, which means that in the wild, most of the time, you're going to have reds mating with reds and blacks mating with blacks, and that's called assortative mating. Now, this is quite important, obviously, for uh, influencing the population dynamics, not just of color, but also of the behavior of the individuals. Now, in the current paper, the authors were aiming to show that this kind of color behavior polymorphism can be, used to, can be understood using that hawk dove framework. And further, in addition, they wanted to add in this real-life biological detail, so replacing the traditional asexual hawk dove model with the sexual model that has all these complications about mate choice and dominance and recessiveness of certain genes and all these other sorts of real dynamics that they have from the wild in order to see how this changes how much the game is able to uh, provide information about a certain population and how much it's then able to predict. Does the prediction get even better and even closer to reality? So here we know that redfinches have priority access to suitable tree cavities, or these things that are essential for breeding. We also know that the breeding success of nesting pairs where the male is red declines with an increasing proportion of reds in the local population. So that's that whole tension between um, the number of hawks you have and the success of your tactic. And this is because they have this increased aggression. So they have a lot of testosterone. They also have a lot of stress, so the corticosterone. They have compromised health. And there's also this reduction in paternal care by red adults. So we know all of this actually from doing field work previous to the study. So they can put all this into the model, and ultimately what they were able to show was that this has a negative population level consequence, uh, but it's not negative enough to completely remove the red morph from the population because whenever the red morph is rare, it's able to get access, priority access to the cavity and then breed quite efficiently. So it's a really interesting dynamic where despite the fact that in many ways it can be kind of bad to be red in some occasions, it also can be good enough that that is kept in the population. Now I'll give you a bit of a break for a moment. I'll play a song for you and then we'll come back and actually think about the model and think about how they ran the analyses in order to look into this in more detail. Welcome back to The Wild Side. This is your host, Caitlin Kite. And that was Dolly Parton with Coat of Many Colors. Now on today's show, in case you're just joining us, I'm talking about a recent study that looks at Gouldian finches, and uh, these finches have different head colors, and they also have different behaviors that correspond with those head colors. And so researchers have taken a lot of information about these birds uh, associated with studies of the animals in the wild and in aviaries, and they've then used that to help create biological models in order to figure out how useful is this thing called the hawk-dove game, which is a theoretical game that can be used to think about uh, kind of how often animals choose to do certain behaviors rather than other behaviors relative to other animals in the population that have those behaviors. 
and also to think about kind of just maintaining overall variability in traits within a population. So they were interested in kind of testing the usefulness of this model because this seemed to be potentially one of the first cases in the wild where the tenets of the model actually held up. And then they wanted to use that to see if they could extract kind of actually useful, applicable data about the animals. So what were the variables that they included in this model? Well, because the finches are so rare, they first of all wanted to include some information about the stochastic variation in the local population, in particular in the local population sizes. So these sizes can be quite small. As I said, there are only about 2,500 of these birds out in the wild. So some of the little pockets of animals can actually be quite little. And they also wanted to show variations in uh, morph ratios, because obviously if you've got only a few individuals and then there's some kind of uh, sudden environmental change that takes away half of you, if you've only got five individuals and suddenly now you've only got a couple, then you know you are more likely to suddenly have all blacks or all reds simply by chance because it's that event has killed off all the variation in your population. So this is accounting for the fact that even these minor environmental events can lead to large fluctuations in population dynamics because they are removing these uh, significant numbers or proportions of birds of a certain type of morph. Now in order to account for this, they use what's called an individual based model. And this is something I referred to last week uh, when I was thinking about the modeling paper from that, uh, the vultures that were using the sky networks. So if what they do is they kind of say that the computer needs to keep track of a bunch of individuals that each have their own parameters, that each kind of go through the time steps doing whatever they should do, acting however uh, a computer based bird should act. And then they collectively at the end of all this count up all the different things that they're seeing. So all of the remaining individuals that are still in that model population at the end, they look to kind of see what state they're in or what they're doing or whatever thing is of interest. So that's what an individual based model is. You model a whole lot of little things and then kind of count that up to get an average or an overall idea of what happens in the population. And in this case, it, it was tracking the fate of each individual on an annual basis until it died. So looking at it starting off, breeding for however many seasons, and then ultimately leaving the population again. So there's some set num number of individuals that they start off with across in number of habitat patches that each have B breeding sites per patch. And they can change N and they can change B uh, depending on which model iteration they are on. They can just tweak all these little things and see how that affects the model. Now they could also include sexual reproduction data, which creates a more interesting and dynamic model. And that's especially true given that we know that Kuldi and Finches have this deliberate uh, choice of mates, and they also can bias their offspring sex ratios depending on the phenotype of the breeding pair. So they can actually kind of judge uh, based on how compatible they think they are with their own mate, how successful they've been in getting a good mate, they can adjust their offspring sex ratios. The females somehow can do this internally, and potentially also uh, when they're incubating the eggs. I'm not entirely sure how the birds do that. Now, each individual was characterized by genotype, sex, nesting site, whether it was a good quality tree hollow or not, and the nature of the parental pair. So what was the combination of the parental genotypes, or what they're calling here the origin. So just as a reminder, the genotype is either a big R or a little r for females, two big R's, a big R, little r, or two little r's for the males, indicating uh, whether they are going to be expressing the aggressive trait or not expressing it, and whether they've got uh, the black trait, the, the dove trait, as a recessive that they carry that could be passed on to their young. Now the variable origin could have one of six different values depending on the genotypes of the bird, though some combinations weren't possible. Uh, so basically they were just saying the female could be an R paired up with a little r, little r, or she could be um, a little r paired up with a big r, big r, you know, it's just kind of going through all the possible uh, com combinations of male plus female. However, they also made sure that they couldn't accidentally produce impossible genetic combinations of the offspring. So for example, they made sure that a little r mother couldn't produce uh, a male offspring that was big r, big r, because she's not carrying that big r allele, so she couldn't pass it on. So they made sure that this was all really biologically accurate in, in reproducing the inheritance of the genes, the traits from one individual to another.
Now the ratios of different individuals in the population also influence the numbers and the types of pairings within the population, and this has an impact on mate choice and the production of new offspring. And there are going to be likelihoods about all these things that depend on the strength of the assortative mating preferences. And again, I mentioned that assortative mating is when you are mating with something like yourself. And it might be that you have a really strong preference to do that, or kind of a mild one, or basically none at all. So they could manipulate this in order to see how it impacted uh, the outcome. So they could then kind of test, given what they knew in, in the field, they could test the different parameters in the model and see if they kind of matched up. So the strength of assortative mating uh, is a uh, little a, so that's the variable that they included. So an a equals one is a random mating, so a hawk and a dove female wouldn't really express a preference for a hawk or a dove male, but then populations with A greater than 1 would mate assortatively with respect to head color or uh, behavior, however you like to talk about it. So hawks are preferring to mate with hawks and doves with doves and so on. And as you increase A, that preference is getting stronger and stronger. The model also considers the fact that hawks, whether you're talking about a big R, big R, or big R, little r male, have a competitive advantage in contests over nest sites. That's the whole thing, and they're more aggressive. But they also have a declining breeding success as hawk density increases, because they're all fighting with each other, they all have stress levels, they're all spending too much time away from the nest and not with their young. So we know from field research that they aren't doing quite as well. So to reflect this in the model, they have a parameter called uh, K. Uh, and K itself is basically an elevated success of hawks when a good nest site is contested. And so by adjusting how big or little k is, they can adjust how much of an advantage or not the hawks have. They can also, in conjunction with this, use a parameter that they call f to reflect the effects of frequency dependence on breeding success. And again, this is drawn from real data. So f equals 1 is what's seen in the real world. So basically, we know that uh, at some amount, some uh, number of times that you see this particular trait out in the wild, it can be advantageous, but as that goes up, it starts to become disadvantageous because there are too many of them. As it goes down, uh, it may have no impact or it may become even more useful. So they can adjust this again so that f greater than 1 is a really steep decline in success, more even than is observed in the wild. f equals 0 indicates that there's no frequency dependence whatsoever. They use the known relationships between the parental phenotypes, clutch size, sex ratio, and also sex and color-specific survival of offspring to figure out how many young of each morph would be produced each year by the breeding efforts. So they know from the wild that if a female of a certain type ma mates with a male of a certain type, they're likely pr to produce however many eggs in the nest, and that would go on to produce however many chicks and some proportion of those chicks would actually fledge, and some of them would be females versus males, and all of that is known from observations that they've already done, so they can enter those actual numbers into the model in order to make these predictions of the model even more realistic. And they know that annual survival in the wild is probably much lower than in the aviary conditions where they've taken some of these measurements, so they did do a little bit of math in order to modify their values accordingly and investigate both kind of uh, aviary type numbers but also real world wild uh, situation type numbers. And what they found is that when they run this model, and I'll talk a little bit more in a second about how, um, how they actually run it, they found that it really quickly stabilizes. So it, sometimes with models you find that they just go back and forth and back and forth and they don't ever seem to kind of reach an end point. And normally an endpoint would be kind of an equilibrium where suddenly you've got none of something, everything just kind of decreases to zero, or you've got a really sustainable amount of something. Or it might be that there's a, a very predictable pattern where it's going kind of back and forth between the two. So it's kind of really high, really low, really high, really low, and that's just how it goes forever. And what you want is just to ultimately reach some state where you can see that it, it has reached a point where it, that is very predictable from there on out. It's not just going to be some completely random thing that's happening. And they indeed found that after about 500 years, they did find that they either had uh, a polymorphism, so they had clear black and red burrs existing forever in the population, or they had the extinction of either one or both of the morphs. So 500 years seemed to be a good period over which to run the analysis. So let's think about 
how they actually ran the simulation. So actually what I really mean is how they ran the simulations, plural, because they did hundreds and hundreds of these things in order to use all the different uh, little variables that I just mentioned in combination with each other over all these different 500 years of births. So the model starts off with what they call an initialization stage, and they have to basically start with some collection of birds that have some collection of traits that they think represents some average useful kind of population number that they can start with to begin the whole breeding process, the whole computerized breeding process. And they assume a frequency of the red allele and a frequency of the black allele, and they just go from there. So they've got uh, a selection of females and males with each of their color alleles. Uh, so again, you're going to have one of the alleles for the females, two for the males because of which chromosomes they have. Then these are going to be randomly chosen as either uh, a big R or a little r, depending on kind of a, a distribution of these things in some real world population. None of the individuals start off with a nest, so they all have to first get a nest, get a mate, and then start breeding. And they also chose original variables uh, in terms of what um, origin these birds had from their own parents in order to start off then what traits, what big R's and little R's they could pass on to their own young. So they run this once, and then they get kind of that first generation that then starts going through the iterative process of the 500 generations. And that goes as follows. Each individual is first randomly assigned to one of the habitat patches. Each patch is assumed to have a certain number of breeding sites, and it is, uh, it is possible for more individuals to attempt to breed than can actually find room to do so, and we do see that in the wild. So these birds are, in fact, potentially competing with each other for space. Females within each location are randomized in terms of the order in which they can choose mates, and the probability of a female choosing a particular mate is proportional to his attractiveness, which is determined by assortative mating. So is he different from the female? Is he matching the female? Uh, you know, can, can she tell whether he is the, the type of bird that she actually wants to be with? And chosen males are then made unavailable as social mates for the remaining females, and it is possible, if there's a sex ratio that's not one-to-one, -one, that some birds could remain without a mate. The social pairs then compete for the nest sites, and pairs with a hawk male, so one that's big R, big R, or big R, little r, have a competitive advantage. And the probability that a pair then obtains a nest is proportional to how competitive they are. And nests gain owners in a way such that there is, uh, they keep going that way, sorry, until there are either no more nests left or there are no more pairs left to choose mates. Each nest possessing pair then breeds, and the clutch size is determined probabilistically uh, using distributions from field data. So basically they've gone out in the field and they've said, okay, we found, you know, 50 pairs of birds, and we see that across those 50 pairs there's some distribution where X number of birds have zero eggs, Y number of birds have one, two, three, four, and so on. So they kind of create this little diagram of how many birds have how many eggs, and then they kind of randomly choose from that distribution to make uh, a similar distribution here in the computer model. And uh, once they have done this, they have produced some ratio of, of sexes also within those eggs, some number of males versus females. This is also based on collected data. The survival of these chicks will depend on the genotypes of the parents and also of the chick and on the local proportion of hawks. Again, all of this reflecting what happens in the wild. Now each year, as you know, there are going to be new young produced, and these young can go on to then produce chicks and to, to mate the next year. Some of the adults will also survive into the next year, so you've got this population that will have older and also younger birds all mixed in. And the survival of animals is both relative and absolute. So it's related to their own and their parental genotypes, and it's also based on aviary studies, but then adjusted to indicate the wild, real-life kind of values. Now, after recruitment and adult survival were computed, the time count is updated from the first year to the next year to the next year, and so on, through 500 years. And individuals were assumed to redistribute themselves again in the following year. So each time it's kind of reset such that they have to get a new mate and get a new nest. And this is kind of how these guys function in the wild. And again, as I said before, the 500-year period was sufficient time to achieve population stability, 
So we found that there was either protected polymorphism, so you see the, um, the continuance of both the red and the black morphs, or where the survivor survival was quite low, you might also have extinction of the whole population. And they conducted lots and lots of runs with subtly different parameter value combinations, and then used all the resulting data to create these kind of color-coded mosaics where they, uh, you could see the red squares and the black squares and kind of see as one value shifted up or down relative to another whether that meant that you were more likely to have more reds or more blacks or kind of some combination of the two. And so they create these nice little graphs where you can tell at a glance what sorts of traits are favoring what sorts of birds. Welcome back to The Wild Side. This is your host, Caitlin Kite, and that is One Republic with Life and Color. Now, just before the break, I was talking about the statistical model that was used in the study that I'm discussing this week on Gouldian finches, and now I want to think about the results of that model. So I've given you all this preparation about the theoretical background, all the parameters that are in the model, all of the real-world stuff that was thrown in to make it as realistic as possible, and what did they find? Well, first of all, they found that the degree of assortative mating is a really critical factor in the continued persistence of both morphs. So when you remove assortative mating, the polymorphism, the distinct uh, black versus red uh, phenotypes, was not maintained, no matter what the other parameter values were. So clearly, it's really important for females to prefer males that look like themselves, and, and vice versa. And the polymorphism was also never maintained when the hawks didn't have frequency-dependent breeding success. So clearly, it, it is quite also important um, that you are more successful than others at, at low densities of your trait, but then kind of uh, constrained and held back a little bit when there are lots expressing your same trait. And cumulatively, this means that for the polymorphism to be protected and to be maintained in the population over time, there has to be a decline in hawk reproductive success with hawk frequency and also assortative mating. And this is a combination of features that are found in the original game, so that decline in reproductive success as your frequency goes up, and also uh, a, a feature that's been introduced here in a hawk dove model for the first time, and that's that second trait where they've got sexual mating rather than asexual reproduction. Now, successful breeding requires investment in contests over nest sites, as well as parenting expenditures. And so, uh, improvements in parenting ability benefit populations more than increased investment in a competitive trait. And as a result of this, we should expect that investment in competition at the expense of parenting should have negative population consequences. So what I'm talking about here is expression of the hawk trait, or the, the red-headed trait. And this is, in fact, visible in the model which indicates that the finches need more habitat to reach a population size when coexisting as a polymorphism than in cases where they've got only blacks, uh, only the, the kind of dove-style birds that are not wasting their resources by fighting over them. Now, extinctions should result from severe habitat destruction and also low survival. And this is um, something that they found in the models that they think could be quite useful in the real world because you could just go out and do a quick census to see what birds you've got and then kind of yield some information about the population health. And interestingly, they found that extinction and population declines could occur even where certain parameters look quite healthy. So for example, there were places, there were certain models where when annual survival is really high, both of the polymorphisms still went extinct and the population vanished. However, they also found that when survival is quite low, they had persistence at length of uh, the black-headed populations of birds. So extinction doesn't necessarily occur because of problems with the habitat or of survival, but because of the different morph frequencies and how these different birds interact with each other. So where hawks take over nest sites and breed successfully, but not successfully enough to maintain the productivity of the population, that's really going to be a problem and potentially make certain populations vanish altogether. So overall, what they were saying, uh, what they were seeing from these models, is that hawk dove persistence is possible, but only where hawk parenting is better than currently known to be the case in the wild. And so they tended to find that you would have populations that would kind of go um, towards one direction or another, but not have kind of both of those things hanging out in the same population for a really long period of time.
So what does all of this mean? I, I say this every week, I step you through and then I always stand back and, and say we need to pull all of this together. Well overall, the population level responses of the Gouldian finch were a bit surprising uh, and they were quite diverse when the birds were faced with all of these challenges that they could throw in using the model. And overall the hawk dove game was much more interesting because they were able to introduce this real world complexity and get an idea of all the little things that could influence um, whether or not these traits were persisting and how they persisted. Now they feel, the authors feel, that the model could be expanded to include more behavioral characteristics in the future. So for example, uh, rather than just say that if individuals don't secure a nest site, that's it, they could make a model where the individuals are able to disperse to a new location and potentially do something there. Now they don't think that this probably necessarily happens in the wild because you know, within a breeding season it might be hard to get to another site, or if you go out and try to do that, you might find that uh, there's been a fire and so there aren't cavities and it's just not possible. But it is a potential thing that could happen, another alternative strategy, and they could experiment with how this can happen. And it might actually be the case that if they want to encourage this, they could go out into the wild, introduce some cavities, and see whether this helps birds reproduce more than they're currently reproducing, and whether this might help uh, recover this population or this species that's having some conservation issues. The data also reveal that morph frequencies have significant impacts on population dynamics and this is interesting because there have been some recent reviews that have suggested that polymorphisms should be beneficial for population persistence and growth because you've just got a lot of variety in the population and this is always good because the more genes you've got, the more likely you are to be able to respond to whatever is happening in the environment. But here is a clear case where it's actually not necessarily that good to have this amount of variation. You want to be black or red and preferably you want to be a big population of blacks only. Um, otherwise, things aren't going to go so well because you've got that aggressive hawk trait potentially causing lots of problems. So here is a case where clearly polymorphism is uh, not necessarily behaving the way that we would suspect that it might. They also mentioned that it's a little bit surprising that the polymorphism was not maintained in the absence of assortative mating because there has been some work showing that actually assortative mating could lead to reduced gene flow and ultimately speciation. And This is something I talked about recently when I was discussing the ring species down in Australia. Uh, so we know that when there is gene flow between incipient species, budding species, and where hybrid fitness is compromised, that can really affect what happens with, these, uh, with this assortative mating process. And there's quite a different outcome than within species poly color polymorphism, that's quite hard to say, because the species would fail to coexist, and then you would only have a single species of a single color remaining. So in other words, what you would expect is that assortative mating would lead to monomorphism, rather than, uh, in this case, where monomorphism was only found where there was no assortative mating. So it's pretty much exactly the opposite. And they feel that the discrepancy here can be explained by time scales. So the previous models that were looking at this were thinking over quite long um, time scales where you've got selection ha happening and acting on assortative mating and then causing consequent evolutionary changes that might then affect whether or not you're continuing to mate assortatively. But here, they just kind of picked uh, an assortative mating value and stuck with it. And so this is more kind of a short-term sort of thing. And these are dynamics that you could potentially throw into a further model that you might then run for more than uh, only 500 years. Now this model only looks, uh, it's looking at positive frequency dependence. So whichever morph is initially common, the individuals enjoy elevated reproductive success under random mating because usually they're mating with their own color and they're avoiding genetic incompatibility. So in other words, uh, the rare morph is suffering a cost of being rare because it's incompatib incompatible with the majority of available mates and therefore would ultimately be lost from the population. And this doesn't happen, so the polymorphism is maintained if enough of the rare individuals can avoid mating with incompatible mates. And uh, they can do this if mating is sufficiently assortative. So this all depends on kind of what they're really cueing in on when they choose their mates and whether this trait then is kept in the population. Now one of the things that they hope they can do in the future is consider what happens when you think about the effects of other species. So they know that populations that face internal conflict, like the reds versus the black, 
can become weaker interspecific competitors. And Gouldian finches do compete with nest spaces with other finches, which would favor the hawks, except that the hawks aren't better parents. So that makes these dynamics even more confusing, but also even more interesting. Now the authors admit that this, auth this model does have some unique variables that are quite specific to the Gouldian finches themselves. However, they think that it's likely a generalizable thing, uh, especially the idea of including sexual reproduction parameters rather than asexual. And so it could be useful for other animals as well. And given that it's not really possible to do experimental work on Gouldian finches because of the conservation status, it actually could be really useful to find another species on which to do modeling like this and then do some actual experiments where you could tweak a few values and let the birds breed and see how uh, the resulting phenotypes and behaviors match up with the model predictions. So then you could actually mesh the theory with the experimental stuff, and that is really where you've got the most powerful science being done, where you can create a real production and then go out and test it and see whether things live up to what you expect or not. And I'm afraid that I'm all out of time. I hope you have enjoyed this one last foray into uh, the theoretical, and I promise I will give you a bit of a break in the future, something light and fluffy and totally easy to comprehend. Uh, but for now, I hope you enjoyed that, and I will talk to you next week.